Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello, welcome with me today to share the 10 books that had a major impact on her journey of spiritual awakening is award-winning broadcaster, producer, author, health, wealth, and happiness teacher, Gail Harris. One of the first television anchor women in America, Gail Harris spent decades as a political reporter and award-winning journalist working for PBS and NPR. She co-produced and hosted the Emmy award-winning documentary, Hiroshima Remembered for PBS, and co-hosted a PBS series on campaign finance reform called Follow the Money which received an Overseas Press Club Award in 1997. And that's not all, as they say, but when it comes to interesting achievements, Gail Harris has a lot more to share, and we'll find out about that as we move on through the show. Um, Gail Harris, welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here, Sandy. Good to have you on the show, Gail. So first of all, tell me about your relationship with books. What do they mean to you? I have had a book in my hand, Sandy, for as long as I can remember. I even remember at age four or so having one of those big Disney books. I couldn't read the words yet, but I was fascinated by the pages. And my parents wound up sending me to, they scraped together the money on an army captain's salary to send me to private school when I was five because I was too young to go to public school. I think my mom was trying to get me out of the house, quite frankly. But that was where I learned to read. And as I say, I, it was my gateway to the world. It, it opened up places and people and adventures that I never would have encountered otherwise. Mm. How um, challenging was it for you to have to distill all of the books that have impacted you down to just 10? Well, I'm tempted to say it's an impossible task, but it isn't really impossible. It was very challenging, though, and and it's such a gift. I, I would recommend that everybody do this because to go back and think about your journey, where you started and where you are now, I kept coming across ideas of, oh, that's where that came from. Oh, I knew that, and that's where I got it. So it's it's a wonderful exercise to go through, and particularly because, as we'll talk about later, I trust, Life has, has taken me in some very unexpected places. And as I went back and looked at this list, it makes perfect sense to be where I am and doing what I'm doing. Who knew? It's, it's a great journey of joining the dots, isn't it? It is. Yeah. You know, I often think the same thing, that you, you, you don't know why you make the decisions that you make, but later on, and you look back and you go, oh, yeah, that really prepared me for what I'm doing now. Exactly. Being able to connect those dots is a really meaningful exercise. But yes, trying to get it to 10 out of hundreds, uh, that that is a challenge. Mm. So did you present your list to me in chronological order or just random? Pretty much chronological because that was the only way I could make sense of it. It was it was just such a voluminous uh, amount of material. So most of it is chronological. Later, as we get deeper into the list, some of these things were happening simultaneously. Some of them are a little bit out of order. But for, for the most part, I tried to make it as linear as I could just to keep it straight in my own head. OK, so book one is a book that not only achieved the accolade of being the first astrology book ever to earn a spot on the New York Times bestseller list, but is also widely considered responsible for accelerating the growth of the New Age movement. And of course, it is Linda Goodman's Sun Signs, published in 1968. So tell us about this book, how you encountered it, and when, and what it meant for you. 
Well, I grew up in the deep south in suburban Atlanta, so it wasn't, you know, totally in the woods. But my mother was a devout member of a, a pretty strict religious uh, organization that to them, you know, anything like astrology was the devil's work. And so that was that was to be stayed away from. And it was after I decided that I did not want to uh, be part of this religious group anymore. And I went out on my own and became self-supporting that I encountered the Sun Signs book. And I thought, oh, you know, let's see what this is all about. And I opened it up to read pretty much an amazing description of, of the person that I was and am. And I thought, wait a second. I, I thought this was all terrible scurrilous stuff. That's what I've been told for the last 18 years. And now here's this description of me that seems pretty accurate. And I've got one little segment I'd, I'd love to share with you, if that's OK. Go ahead. OK, let's see. You know what? This is going to require reading glasses, one of those necessary annoyances. This is about Sagittarians, which is what I am. So she'll always be a little outspoken because she sees the world exactly as it is, even while she's wearing those ridiculous rose tinted glasses. That you must admit is quite a talent. It's not everyone who can apply clear, reasonable logic to every situation and retain the happy faculty of believing things will get better or else deciding to accept them for what they are. Sagittarius females are regular Pollyannas. Yep, my mom used to describe me as going through life in a state of carbonated euphoria. <laughs> I think that is probably still true today. I, I do look for the good. I do um, live a pretty, well, more than pretty. I, I live a happy life and it's, it's a deliberate choice. And it was nice to see that that was echoed in the uh, stars and what they were doing when I happened to land here. Did she say anything about, um, you know, the ideal career for you? Hmm. You don't recall being guided on your path, your career path, by something that she wrote about Sagittarians? I think the, I, I didn't look for that specific point, but it's an interesting one because certainly Sagittarians are very curious. We love to travel. We love to have new adventures. We have the other piece that, that struck me in revisiting it was that we have a strange aloofness or can have to family ties because what we are doing feels so compelling to us that we're going to do it, period, whether anybody else approves or not. And, and certainly that is part of it. Mm -hmm. So were you already on a, your career path then? I was. I was. I was a newspaper reporter. That was my first job. I actually began writing for my local newspaper when I was in high school. The local paper in suburban Atlanta had a teen page that was published every Sunday during the school year. And I started writing for the paper. And from the moment I got my first byline, I thought, well, this is pretty interesting. It affirmed that I could observe and write about interesting things and people. And I just loved it. That's that's really what launched me on my career as a journalist. Mm. OK, let's move on to book two, um, The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, originally published in 1923. When did that come into your orbit? Can't pinpoint an exact date, but it must have been in my early 20s. And again, it was one of those amazingly lovely and lyrical ways of looking at the world and not something that I had encountered, his, his way of, of describing people, situations, love, marriage, relationships, children, all the ways in which you can frame how you see the world. And there was one in particular that struck me again as I looked at it. This was about marriage. Mm -hmm. and about relationships and how we can be with one another. Fill each other's cup, but drink not from one cup. Give one another of your bread, but eat not from the same loaf. Sing and dance together and be joyous, but let each one of you be alone, even as the strings of a lute are alone, though they quiver with the same music. Give your hearts, but not into each other's keeping, for only the hand of life can contain your hearts. And stand together yet not too close together, not too near together, 
for the pillars of the temple stand apart and the oak tree and the cypress grow not in each other's shadow. That was a really critical and important reminder to me of what a relationship should be because I didn't date in high school, wasn't allowed to, uh, anybody who was not part of this religious group. And so after I left and got out on my own, I married the first person I met, first person I ever dated. And it, it was a very controlling relationship. And it must have been, I must have found this after the marriage only lasted a year. And we were able to walk away as friends, each of us realizing we had made a mistake. And this helped me understand what my difficulties were with that relationship that stand, the pillars of the temple stand separately near together, but not too close together, not in each other's shadow. That was very profound information that I had not encountered anywhere before, certainly not within my religious upbringing, which was very strict. And it was a, a revelation of the, what I had been taught the world was about, uh, not necessarily. There are other ways of looking at it. And what a beautifully lyrical way he had of, of summarizing and describing all of those essential life elements. Yeah, yeah. Such a beautiful book. I mean, it really should be considered the Bible. Mm. You know? This is like a guideline for life. Definitely words to live by. If you yeah. had only one book, this might be it. But again, there's so many wonderful books. It's it's hard. I know. I know. <laughs> so book number three, I love this book. I was so pleased to see it on your list. Um, <laughs> it is The Once and Future King by T.H. White. I was lucky to have a dad in particular of I think perhaps both parents were ma massive musical theater fans. They loved musicals. And so I grew up with the soundtracks from Sound of Music and My Fair Lady and Destry Rides Again. And um, most importantly, perhaps Camelot. So I knew all of the music from Camelot, all of the words, got very interested in the legend of King Arthur and uh, Queen Guinevere and what that was all about. And when I came across this book, I've, I've since read it several times. I'm going to read it again this summer because it is just such a delight. It explores it in so such an interesting way, really essential themes that we're grappling with right now. Mm -hmm. Might versus right. Uh, racial issues are in here. Again, how you look at the world, the sort of magic and mystery that's around. And I've got an excerpt there too, okay? Sure, yeah. This is one about when the very young King Arthur comes under Merlin, the magician's tutelage. Oh, I'm gonna need the glasses. Depends on whether the print is large or small. And Archimedes is Merlin's owl who perches on his shoulder. And so Arthur is trying to make friends with Archimedes and he wishes he would talk to him. And Merlin says, well, perhaps if you were to give him this mouse here politely, he might learn to know you better. Merlin took a dead mouse out of his skull cap. Quote, I always keep them there and worms too for fishing. I find it most convenient. And handed it to Arthur who held it out rather gingerly toward Archimedes. Archimedes curved beak looked as if it were capable of doing damage. But Archimedes looked closely at the mouse, blinked at Arthur, moved nearer on the finger, closed his eyes and leaned forward. He stood there with closed eyes and an expression of rapture on his face, as if he were saying grace. And then, with the most absurd sideways nibble, took the morsel so gently that he would not have broken a soap bubble. I mean, the whole book is like this, just these amazing descriptions. It is lyrically mm -hmm. written again and just laugh out loud funny. So I can't wait to read it again. And I'm so glad that this exercise prompted me to do that. I had actually thought about it a while back of, as I was putting it away, putting it on its newest bookshelf. Um, that's, that's one to go back and revisit. How many times do you think you've read it? At least four. So this will be my fifth, but each time, that's one of the things I find so interesting. My, my husband kind of gets puzzled at why I like to reread things because I already know the story. I know how it turned out. But what I found is that the person who read it at 20 
or at 30 or at 40 is a different person than the one who's reading it now. I look at it with different eyes. I'm coming from a different place. And there are always new things I learn from the books that I love and cherish and have read. New ways of looking at them, new, way, new ways of feeling enriched by them. And that's why I think if you particularly love a book, go back, do it again. See if anything strikes you differently, if anything speaks to you differently. I suspect it will, or it certainly has for me. Mm, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, we find different things at different times, don't we? Mm. I've, I've gone back and read a book before and thought, I don't think I've read this book before, but I know that I have. Yeah. Or so, I don't remember this part. Was yes, that in there all along? And, yeah. and for whatever reason, when I brought my then self to it, I just wasn't prepared to it to get it into my brain in the same way. Mm. I think that was the very first of the Arthurian books that I read, and I went on to read so many after that. But um, apparently, he he this was a collection of shorter fantasy novels that he'd published from 1938 to 1940. And then he amended it and published uh, the complete book in 1958. I'm very glad he did. Well, this is the 1939 version. And so the first part of it is the section of, of the young Arthur that Disney took over as being the sword and the stone, which also I had seen as a little kid. And then the, the more complete story of, of Arthur as uh, an older man and how everything transpired during that time as well. And, and you know, as I think about it now and the issues that we're facing now in contemporary society, the whole idea of, is it might or is it right? Does right make might or is it the other way around? Is it just the people who have the most uh, guns and missiles who are going to determine things? Or do we have a say in the matter and we have the option of being able to say, no, nope, sorry, we're not doing it that way. That was a profoundly, um, revolutionary idea mm. yeah and it is interesting how everything goes around and comes around again and again and again it's the same things all the time that we're dealing with when will we learn exactly mm. so book number four saved by the light you snuck two in here <laughs> saved by the light and secrets of the light by danny and brinkley and I think the first one was published in 1994. Not so sure about the second one. Um, but that Danian story is an amazing story. Well, this was about the time when I did a major pivot in my life. My eyes were opened in, in some very interesting ways because while as a skeptical journalist, I had always been curious. I always want to know everything about everything, although, of course, you can't. But in my, let's see, in about 92, 93, about that time, I had an experience in which I was uh, helping a university set up its, they bought a TV station and they, they were trying to figure out how to, to manage it and the programming it should have and so on. Well, I jumped in enthusiastically with both feet. I had always wanted to manage something like that and to be part of the programming decisions. And I began working full tilt boogie um, pretty much 24 seven. And much to my surprise, I started getting sick and I had always had good health uh, despite my demanding career. But all of a sudden I started getting sick. And what do you do when you wanna shut up a TV person? You take away their power of speech. So. I would get this mysterious laryngitis and it would just knock me on my, off my feet and I would have to adjourn to bed and pull up the covers and wait until my voice came back. And it was generally about a week or so. And after a while, I got tired of that and annoyed that this was happening. And I remembered a story that I had done years ago when I was a correspondent for ABC News Nightline in the States about mind-body medicine. And this the interview with Dr. Herb Benson, who was kind of the godfather of mind-body medicine at the time, started with Tibetan monks going into a 45 degree Fahrenheit cave, wrapping wet linen sheets around themselves, and then going into a deep meditative state and steaming the sheets dry. And they did it not once, but a few times. There were no trick photography. You can imagine ABC 
checked this, fact checked this up one side and down the other. They had one person whose only job was to fact check everything that was said and, and all the, the pieces that aired. And so I remembered that and thought, well, okay, if that's something that we can do, maybe I should try this meditation thing that Herb Benson has been talking about. And so I began meditating and I stopped getting sick. And that really was a, a big change in my life because while I still had one foot firmly planted in the, the world of skeptical, not cynical, but skeptical journalism, in that you can tell me the sun is shining, but I'm going to ask for a second source and then I'm gonna to go to the front door, open it up and take a look myself. Hmm. That was enough to convince me that there must be something to this. And so part of that was, all right, what else is out there? I had read Ray Moody's work back in the eighties, but that was about the time that I started looking and along comes Daniel Brinkley's books. And I just, I liked, I liked that he was a good old boy. I liked the, the kind of personality that he brought to this because he like so many people who have been involved in spiritual journeys, when something amazing first happens to them, they're standing there, me, what, excuse me, what am I supposed to be doing? What is this all about? And I just found him a really interesting person. His experiences going through this, not once, but twice were really illuminating. So I have just a couple of, a couple of quick things that I wanted to say or from him. And this is how he encountered this. I never saw it coming and I died without a belief in any particular God or an opinion about the afterlife. I was 25 years old and wide open to just about everything. On September 17th, 1975, my life was forever changed. I was struck and killed by a bolt of lightning. After spending 28 minutes on the other side, I was sent back to spread the good word. There is no such thing as death. In 1994, he was published by a pub. He was approached by a publisher who wanted him to write a book about his experience. And he said, well, first I saw no reason to do that since I couldn't understand why anyone would want to read it. I wasn't a celebrity or anybody in the public eye. I was just a simple country boy with a great after dinner story to tell. I hardly thought it had the makings of a best selling book. Well, it did. It wound up selling probably millions of copies. I'm not sure exactly. And then he did the second book. And again, I think the, the compelling nature of what happened to him, the way in which it changed his life, the things that he encountered uh, in this whole experience, and the fact that I'm now doing work that is in alignment with what I was reading back in 94, 95, I guess. Um, it, again, it was one of those, yep, Yep. Okay. This makes sense now. Thank you. As opposed yeah. to just, I love the book. Not any particular thing, uh, but I love the book and it, it was an eye opener. Yeah, it was. Um, and it was a movie too. It was. Yeah. Simple um, country boy with a story to tell. Yeah. Amazing. And then he got stuck, struck by lightning a second time. He did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Daniel, in case you didn't get it the first time. <laughs> you know, I actually interviewed him once on um, the Virtual Light broadcast, and I know you're familiar with that show, and I just could not stop laughing. I mean, he is such a comedian. He really is. Um, I can just imagine what he might have said, you know, when he crossed over the second time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> Again? Yeah, well, and a lot of things have come true that he was told. Yes, they have. And I think part of what makes him such an authentic voice is not just what happened to him, but the very low key, humble, yeah. I'm sharing this with you in the hope that you will find it helpful to you is I think exactly the right spirit. He wasn't setting out to be a best-selling author. He was setting out to tell a story that he thought would be helpful to people. And he has done a lot of work around that uh, of assisting people when it's their time to go. And I wholeheartedly applaud that work as well. Mm, indeed. Book number five, The Eagle and the Rose, A Remarkable True Story by Rosemary Altia, published in 1995. Well, this probably came after I had read Daniel's book. 
because again, I was, I having had my interest piqued by that, I was looking for anything else I could find along this line. Could anyone else corroborate it? Could anyone validate it? What else was there out there? And this happened across my path. And I remember vividly, Sandy, I, I had a, a kitchen with a skylight in it, uh, living in Boston at the time. And my favorite place to read was a little corner of the kitchen and underneath the skylight. And I remember going through this book and she talks about her experience, not unlike Daniel's, although in a different way, but here she was hearing voices, thinking she was crazy. And then it began to make sense. And she began to be working. She began working as a medium and translating messages to people from the other side, to people here who really wanted to hear them. And I remember sitting there, the first part of the book kind of explains all of that. And then she goes into a series of specific readings that she did for people and how sometimes the information came through and it seemed a little blurry or it didn't seem to make sense. And then the other person could make sense of it. And just the specificity of it, the clarity of it, the way in which she describes it, story after story after story. And I, I remember sitting at the table and just bursting into tears and thinking, oh, you know, so this is how, this is how it works. This is what it's about. Ha, huh, what a relief, because that was certainly not the message that I grew up with. Um, could have been worse. I mean, there are certainly people who grew up with messages that are much more, more horrifying than the ones I got, but it was pretty much, you know, when you're dead, you're dead, that's it, goodbye. Maybe you'll get resurrected one day and maybe not. But to read these stories after story, after story, after story. So had a profound impact on me when I read it. And then at the time I was doing a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with 300 ultimately of the most interesting people who lived in Boston, came through Boston or were otherwise happened to be available for me to interview. And it was a half hour series uh, of, of in-depth conversations with people. And I had, I had put out the thought after reading the book of, gosh, you know, wouldn't it be really fun if one day I were to interview Rosemary? Wouldn't that be a wonderful kind of connecting of the dots for me personally? Because as I was doing the show, it began to seem as if every third interview idea that crossed my desk had something to do with mind, body, medicine, alternative complementary therapies, spirituality of some sort, people who were working in this arena. And that there was just this, well, wouldn't that be fun to interview her one day? Well, lo and behold, I had made my decision after 300 of these that I really wanted to do other work and walked in one day after lunch. And there was a little card on my desk saying that Rosemary was coming to Boston on a book tour and would I like to interview her? Well, needless to say, my answer is I certainly would. Thank you very much. So she came in and she was lovely and delightful. And as we're doing the interview, I said to her, so Rosemary, tell me how this works. As if I didn't know, of course. And she began describing someone standing behind me and it didn't make sense and it didn't make sense and it didn't make sense. Too long to tell the whole story now. But I just thought, okay, well, that's interesting. Not really who I wanted to be in contact with, but sure, maybe, what do I know? We finished the interview. They're putting away the cameras and chatting about how the interview had gone. And we were both pleased because she did some, some good work on it, just in general, talking about the topic. And I said, you know, Rosemary, I, I really appreciate whoever it was that you saw. I'll see if I can identify somebody like that in my family, which I ultimately did. I said, I'm really interested in, in whether uh, I'd love to be connected to my dad, whom I absolutely adored, who had made his transition in 1988 and she said, well, give me a minute. And she said, yes, there's, there's a man in a, a military uniform standing behind you. And he's ruffling his hands through your hair. And he's saying, this is my little girl. And I'm so proud of her. And then she began telling me, now she didn't know anything about anybody in my family. She starts telling me things about my dad's final illness. And then the, the statement she made, which was, just absolutely my dad. She said, the boy is beautiful, referring to my son, needs to get his teeth fixed. 
Well, this was May, and we were aware that my son's teeth were coming in crooked, and we had made arrangements to see an orthodontist a few months from then. Nobody else knew about this. She didn't know I had a son. I mean, none of this. So again, it was kind of the the cherry on top of the whipped cream on top of the sundae because... Yeah. And, and by the way, I did find out who the woman was who originally came through and she described her perfectly. So. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. And it is wonderful when we meet the authors of books that we've loved and they turn out to be truly nice people. Yes. Truly mm. a nice person and clearly gifted. And again, you know, approaching this from a, from a heart centered place and, having the courage to do it. This stuff isn't easy. You know, folks who are able to do this, it's, it's really, it's so much easier to melt into the background than it is to be able to acknowledge that you have a gift and to be willing to use it and to, to do that in a public way. Mm, indeed. Well, we're going to take a short break now. You're listening to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's 10 Best Spiritual Books weekly interview series and sharing the 10 books that influenced her life journey is award-winning broadcaster, producer, author, health, wealth and happiness teacher, an executive producer of the pioneering documentary, The Last Ecstatic Days, Gail Harris. And we'll be back in a few moments. And when we do, please stay with us because we're going to see the trailer of this heartbreaking and absolutely exhilarating movie. So we'll be back in a short while. Om Times TV. Maya Angelou once said that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and when I'm not hosting Om Times Media's flagship radio show, What Is Going On, and the No BS Spiritual Book Club, I help people share their untold stories. Books are my life, my joy, and my passion. And there is no greater reward than helping aspiring writers get their books out of their heads and into the hands of those who are waiting to read them. If you feel that you have a book in you, but don't know where to begin, visit sedgebeer.com, click on the Work With Me tab and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be just what you've been looking for. That's sedgebeer.com, S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Ohm Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Ohm Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times. Open yourself to the possibilities. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Gail Harris, book number six. This one comes up again and again and again. Many Lives, Many Masters by Brian Weiss, published in 1988. And it comes up again and again and again for a very good reason. In fact, when I went to find my copy on the bookshelf, guess what? Mine was gone because I give these books away to everyone that I feel might need it. Anyone who's had a loss, 
who has been through a heartbreaking experience and in the book. And it's very funny. I was talking to an old friend the other day who is a very, very big name in broadcasting who I would not have thought of as necessarily being that much of a spiritual person. And we were just kind of gently talking around the edges of some of these things. And he said, well, you know, it's, it's a shame that, that there's really not a lot of evidence about people who can speak to being on the other side and coming back. And I said, oh, yes, there is. Do you know Brian Weiss? And he said, oh, right. You told me about him years ago. I must have gotten a hundred of his books. I give them to everybody I come across. I thought, yes, indeed, because Brian's message is so compelling. I first, I don't, I don't even remember where I first got, got his, his books somewhere along the way, but the first one was again, one of those eye-opening ones. And I have since read everything that he's ever written. And I'll tell you a personal story in just a minute, but I, I was struck as I was thinking about this interview again of, this is a second book. This one is about, let's see, what's the title? Uh, Messages from the Masters, which is also really good. And I thought it might be helpful in thinking about people who are wherever you are on your spiritual path, there's always this question about how do I, how do I differentiate? How do I find the real deal versus folks who may have different motives? And I thought this was just a great thing I wanted to share with you. It says the key to discerning a real teacher from a pretender is to follow your own intuitional wisdom. Do the teachings feel right to you? Are they loving, compassionate, nonviolent, and fear reducing? Do they include all other groups, all other humans as equals, as divine souls on the same path of destiny? Do they teach that no one is better than the other, that we're all rowing the very same boat? And do they acknowledge that though they can point out the way, they cannot bring you to spiritual fulfillment? Only you reach your goal, because ultimately our journey home is an inward journey, a personal return. That is one of the most succinct descriptions. What did you think, Sandy? I, I'm, I thought that was just, yes, there it is, exactly. Absolutely. And, you know, that's like the, the quintessential, most fundamental message that, you know, yeah. And home even within. Message. Sorry, go ahead. I said home is within. Exactly. And particularly now when disinformation and misinformation abound, it requires us to be more discerning than ever about who we listen to, what their message is, what it's about whether it's speaking to our heart or reaching for our wallet. Yes. So I, I just wanted to share with, with uh, you and everyone else. I was very fortunate to go to a couple of uh, Brian Weiss's workshops and enjoyed in a group doing the regressions, revisiting a couple of past lives. But one of my favorite experiences with this was with my, I took my husband, he wanted to, after he read Brian's book, he said, oh, you know, I'd love to sit down with him. I said, yes, and so would pretty much everybody else in the rest of the world. At that time, Brian was not doing one-on-one -on -one, um, readings, meetings anymore, but he was conducting workshops. And so we went to a workshop at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York. If you don't know of it, it's worth looking at. They do wonderful work there. And Brian has been doing past life regression workshops there for years. And I believe he may still be doing it. In any case, part of his mission now is to teach the teachers so that more and more people can have access to this information about themselves. This was a midsummer night. It was brutally hot outside. We went inside a gathering space that had about 120 people in there. And he was doing a guided meditation to, to bring us to be able to connect with who we had been. And because it was so hot outside, they had the air conditioning at about 20 degrees in there. I was shivering from the moment I walked in. So we did the first guided meditation. And as we came out of it, I asked my husband, you know, did, how you doing? Did you discover anything? And he said, feel the back of my neck. Okay. The back of his neck was absolutely dripping wet with sweat in about a literally 50 degree room. So what was that all about? Well, he had tapped into a lifetime in which he was a gladiator in Rome under hot sun. And, and that's what 
that was what his life was. And he had other details about that, but that made sense because he's a very much of a fearless leader. I can see him as a gladiator, although good. And he was so struck by that. I mean, to, to physically have that, that manifestation of I'm someplace really, really hot, when in fact his body was someplace really, really cold. So it was, it was fun to share that experience with him. If you ever have a chance to do something like that, again, I recommend it. It's a wonderful way to get in touch with even more fully with who you are is to see if you can find the path that you have walked before. Mm, yeah. You know, and I love when books and thank goodness so many of them are now emerging, but books by people who, you know, um, they're not flakes. You know, they're highly credentialed, psychiatrists, psychologists, scientists, you name it. And they're all having experiences and they're all sharing them. And that's what we need just to prove to people that this stuff is real. I'd love to meet Brian Weiss. I'd love to have him on this show. He is a lovely, lovely man. You would enjoy him tremendously. And, and one of the things that, that I also find interesting about his personal story uh, is that, as you say, I mean, he was a Yale's doctor. He was going to be a medical doctor, which changed, as told in the first book, again, worth reading. And then when he began having these experiences and guiding people through past life experiences, he was reluctant to tell that story for quite some time, understandably mm -hmm. so. It was so completely avant-garde when he did it that it makes sense. And, and again, I applaud the courage of the, these real pioneers along the way who said, well, OK, people may think I'm crazy, but I'm going to do this because this is a, these are stories that need to be told. Yeah. Yeah. Book number seven. I This is the first time this book has showed up. Um, this is the first time any book has showed up by this author. And I'm very glad to see it there because I think it is a very good book. It is Spiritual Psychology, The 12 Primary Life Lessons by Steve Rother and the group. And this was published in 2004. And is still as pertinent today as it was in 2004, I'm sure. I did not know it in 2004. I didn't encounter his work until who probably 2010 thereabouts. But it again is one of those amazing, oh, so that's what this is all about. So that's why I keep dealing with these issues. So that's what my purpose is, is to try to, to work with specific things. It's very clear, this is channeled information. It's, I have found it to be a very credible, reliable source over what, 12 years that, that I've been aware of it, 12, 13, 14, whatever it is. Um, and the I think any time you read something in this, you will again pick up parts and pieces and strands of your own life, and it'll make sense in a way that something hasn't before. And I particularly like what he says about healing. And I marked this, this piece. Um, I'm not sure if this is from him or, or where it came from, but I love this. Heal another and you may change their life. Help another to heal themselves and you will change the universe. Words mm. to live by, as is the whole book. Yeah. Yes, yes, a very good book. Um, thank you. Thank you for bringing it forward. Number eight, Messages from Water by Dr. Masaru Emoto, 1999. This is another classic. I'm sure you know it, Sandy, and many, many people who are listening uh, will. As well. <laughs> and this, again, was one that I encountered early on. And it was one of those, why did I not know this? This is amazing. He was a uh, doctor who photographed water. And it's done under scientific conditions of putting water in specific ways and in and, and specific light sometimes, and then beaming messages of love at them and photographing them, or taking the same water and same situation and beaming messages of hatred and evil and uh, anger and all of that and photographing them. And the difference between these and those is profound. It is, again, if seeing is believing, 
this is one of the things that that will make you think again about our our connection as humans with all that is around us in nature, in water, in trees, in plants, all of the the ancillary messages as well about the the mung bean experiences where mung beans that are prayed over will grow faster. I mean, again, all of this kind of, wow, isn't that interesting? Why didn't I know this before? Connections. This is this is worth seeing for sure. And in fact, in teaching our uh, health, wealth, and happiness course, we show some of these messages in the classroom. And it's it always just brings a smile to my face when I see other people reacting to these pictures the same way I did of, whew, you know, there it is. It, it could hardly be more clear, could it? You know, I've done that experiment with rice and I've done it with children and had the children, you know, two jars, rice in water, say nice things to that one, say not so nice things to that one and watch what happens. The visual does it all. You don't have to teach them anything once they see the results of that. Mm. Exactly. Mm. So book number nine, prepare for surgery, heal faster. Well, well, body techniques, Peggy Huddleston. Peggy Huddleston is a very interesting person who is a graduate of Harvard Divinity School. And she has been doing clinical work around mind-body medicine for a number of years. I encountered her when we were working on the Body and Soul series. And at the time, she was doing a rigorously controlled study on whether preparing for surgery using mind-body techniques would actually help you heal faster, go home sooner, have fewer post-operative complications. Well, guess what? Yes. The answer is, and, and she details it in her book. And it's a, I, I now give it to anybody I know who's going to be facing surgery because let's face it, I mean, that can be a very scary thing, even if it's not a huge procedure, but especially if it's a big one. Used it with my husband when he was having work done on his shoulder. I have worked it with, given it to many, many friends who had various things going on. And the funny part about this is that in 1999, when we shot the segment for, for my series, the book wasn't out. I don't believe the study was still being done. And it was still a little viewed as being a little out there in these medical establishments. Well, guess what? You can go into Massachusetts General Hospital now, which is one of the iconic hospitals in the whole world and ask your anesthesiologist to read you healing statements while you're under and they will and they will nod and they will say oh exactly be my pleasure to so they are now doing things routinely in a setting like that and many others you know why because it works because it makes their patients more confident less anxious a less anxious person is going to in fact do better it just makes total sense and there are a series of techniques in the book and online. She also has a website that, that gives you some basics if you don't have time to read the book or do the, the relaxation exercises. But if you do, it's a really good idea. I think anything you can do to get your physical body ready for an experience that is going to be challenging, including being unconscious, then all to the good to give it the messages that you're going to heal, you're gonna be just fine, that goes in. You may be unconscious, but your brain is still listening. And so those messages matter. And her work has certainly shown that. Yeah. Book number 10, Peace is Every Step, The Path of Mindfulness in Everyday Life by Thich Nhat Hanh, 1992. And I know you've met him because you've interviewed him, haven't you? I have. Uh, the P Peace is Every Step is one of the again, iconic books. And he, uh, Thai, as he was known, uh, that's Vietnamese for teacher. He was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Martin Luther King Jr. Fun fact about him. And through a series of, of wonderful serendipitous things, one of our producers for Body and Soul had worked with him recording Dharma lectures, which he 
did all over the world. And so when we said we're doing this series for PBS, Body and Soul, we would love to, to spend some time at, and perhaps interview Thich Nhat Hanh, please, please. I was the first Western journalist who was ever allowed to set foot into Plum Village, which was his retirement place in France, uh, out in the woods in France. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. And I suppose one of the reasons why he was a little leery of journalists is that everybody wanted to talk politics. And I wanted to talk about what he wanted to talk about, what he writes about. And so we sat down, had a lovely, lovely time together. We wound up spending a week at Plum Village and met some of the other people who were there on retreats. We did a uh, mindfulness walking meditation with him and a group of the other folks who, who work with him and around him and keep the place running. The other great memory I have of it is that they do silent meals. Interesting concept. I never thought about how much energy we expend when we're eating and also being social. And now that can be a good thing, but every now and again, it can be a very interesting contemplative thing to not talk at all, to just really focus on your food. And that, that was his whole message in his, what, 23, 24, 25 books that he's written is be happy every day, be aware with every breath, pay attention. If the phone rings, take that moment to center yourself and, and be ready for it. I mean, these are all very simple things. And what they do is they bring joy to your life on a regular basis. And it's, again, he's just, he's so simple. Um, such a wonderful teacher. And, uh, had a peaceful passing this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. You know, um, we recently uh, did a little um, uh, bookkeeping, if you like, of the 10 best spiritual books um, and which books have been mentioned the most over the last three years, three and a half years that the book club's been going. And um, we came up with, you know, several books that are tied for places in the top 10. But the most, the person with the most number, the biggest number of books that had been recommended was Thich Nhat Hanh. Truly a remarkable being yeah. in every possible sense of the word. That show of yours, um, Body, Mind and Soul, I mean, that was truly groundbreaking back then. Nobody was doing anything like that. Well, they weren't, and it's interesting because I happened to be the at a lecture by Deepak Chopra in the mid, I guess this was the mid 90s. Yeah, must have been. Uh, it was called, it was a body and soul conference. It was put on every year by a wonderful man named David Thorne, who was the publisher of what was then the New Age Journal. And he would bring in speakers of, of various uh, types, people like Deepak. I remember sitting in the audience and thinking, whoa, this is so interesting. Everybody should know about this. Why isn't this on television? And I went back home after that experience and started looking. And I saw that Bill Moyers had done a wonderful work on healing in the mind in the early 90s. It was a series of six, I believe, one hour documentaries, basically, that aired on PBS. But nobody was doing a weekly program dealing with things like Reiki and meditation and mind-body medicine and complementary therapies and moxibustion and, and all of these kind of things that were out there that were just starting to kind of poke their heads above the ground a little bit of, of the noise of what most news was. So I took a deep breath and said, okay, well, I'm looking around. If I don't see anybody else doing this, maybe this is what I'm supposed to do next. And apparently it was. It took up several years of my life. It resulted in the, I got to do the companion book, which was Body and Soul, Your Guide to Health, Happiness, and Total Well-Being. How's that for a, <laughs> that's a pretty uh, big title, but my hope was certainly that people would get that out of it. And it introduced me to just so many remarkable people in the field and strengthen my own conviction as to why this needed to be out there for everybody everywhere to, to see and be exposed to. And it was all about essentially conscious living. Yeah. 
I loved it. Mm -hmm. I, it to this day feels like a gift. And the other funny thing about it as I was doing it, particularly the first show was on staying healthy in a stressful world. And we showed the first meditation, I think that had ever been shown on TV and conventional TV at least. And um, as I was shooting that, I was so interested as I talked to various people about it, about doing the series, about doing the show, particularly the meditation piece, people would say very timidly, um, you know, I, I meditate, you know, it was as nobody wanted to talk about it. And I thought, well, the great purpose of this is to take the, take away some of the, uh, demarginalize how these topics are viewed. We need to bring these into light, into the mainstream so that we can talk about them freely so that you don't have to be nervous about confessing that you too meditate. So as I look at what the world was like in 1997, when I started on that project, 1999, when I got it on the air for the first season, and now, now, well, of course you meditate. Doesn't everybody meditate? Yeah. Different yeah. world. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, pioneering seems to be something that you were born to do. Um, <laughs> you know, you pioneered uh, several things. Um, and you've won Emmys and all kinds of awards for the documentaries that you've done. I love the um, Follow the Money one. I mean, you know, that is one that should be a weekly show. It should still be running now. <laughs> it should. It was a 26-part series on campaign finance reform, and it mm. aired in 1997 on PBS. And, yes, uh, sadly, the lessons that came out of that series certainly should have been taken to heart more than they than they have mm. been because look where we are now but maybe it's time to rerun it <laughs> could be <laughs> yeah so um you took a break from television you set back and you've been doing other things you've been teaching you've been enjoying life you health wealth and happiness teaching and then suddenly you get an opportunity to get involved with a pioneering movie again. Um, and uh, how did that come about? You know, Sandy, it's one of those, um, gosh, what am I doing here stories? Because we, my husband and I had moved from the West Coast back East because we have kids and grandkids in Maine. And we had an opportunity to look around in Asheville, North Carolina, in the Western North Carolina mountains. And it was such a beautiful place. I remembered it from when I was here. I was working in Charlotte, which is about two hours away in my second TV job. And I was young and single and I would get in my car every weekend and I would drive to the mountains. Didn't know anybody, just, you know, tooling around, wanted to be in the mountains because I thought the mountains were so amazing. And I remember when I, five years later, got an opportunity to go to Boston, felt like I had to take it. I thought, you know, I would really like to come back to the mountains one day. And I bought a little lot of land that I was going to put a log cabin on. They were basically giving it away in those years. So, you know, I will always come back to the mountains. Well, got to Boston. It was clear that I was going to be in Boston for the rest of my life. Eh, not really. Didn't turn out that way. But it was it's such an interesting experience to have come back to Asheville now. And it took me a while even to connect that final dot. Of, Wait a minute, I always said I was gonna come back here. Okay, fine, why am I here? One of the first people I met when we moved here said to us uh, I, that he was very involved in something called the Center for Conscious Living and Dying in Asheville. I thought, well, that certainly sounds interesting. Investigated that, got to meet the lovely, remarkable physician who founded it named Aditi Seti. And when she found out about my background, she said, oh, we just finished this amazing film that, and the person whose experience is told in that film is the reason why I started this center. You've got to meet the director. Okay, fine. So she sent me the film and it knocked my socks off. I met the director and the small group of people who were involved in this project and to me, it's the connection between, at one point, I was talking about conscious living with body and soul, and this is a film about conscious dying. With 76 million baby boomers just in the United States alone, contemplating our own mortality, 
it's a really good time to spark a conversation about how we make that transition. What is it like? Can we do it in a conscious way without fear and surrounded by love? And that's what the film is all about. So you got in involved um, and you are the executive producer or an executive producer of the movie. When is it going to be released? We're working on it. Part of the, the, if it were just a movie, you just kind of put it out in the world. But because this is a movie that we all feel so strongly needs to be, to have be more than just something that you watch and go, oh, that's nice, you know, and forget about it. I think this needs to spark a movement as, as do my uh, compatriots in this work. And so we're working on showing it in festivals, affinity groups. To me, the template is there for every community to have this kind of experience available to them that, that Ethan did, who, a remarkable young man he, who you meet in the film. This was his gift to the world. And it's, it's a pretty remarkable gift. Mm. So do you want to tell us a little bit about the movie um, before we play the trailer? Or would you like us to play the trailer first? I'd say, given what I've already said, let's see the trailer and then we can talk more about it if that's all right. Okay, let's watch this trailer. I have more pain if I die later today or tomorrow. <laughs> it's a win. Stay present with that. Do what you need to feel alive. So there's a soul, a dear, blessed, loving soul named Ethan Sisser. He's 36. He was diagnosed with glioblastoma. He started documenting his journey on Facebook, TikTok, YouTube. Doctors said there's nothing they can do. The chemo can't help. Not doing the chemo, nothing will change either. What's going to happen next is I'm going to keep a smile in my heart. One thing I would love is a strong support system. I feel like it could be beautiful for everyone involved. I don't know if anybody's ever done it in terms of how you're doing it. We all are born, we all leave the body, so why not do it in the most beautiful way possible? I'm trying to medically find a way to where he can be comfortable in a home setting. I am embodied. I am empowered. I am ecstatic. Mind if I get this off my chest now. It's a journey with him. And I can only go so far. My sense of Ethan's state of being fills this whole area. He called for a family, and this family showed up. death be fun? I mean, that could be the most exciting journey ever. Gives you goosebumps. I, it brings tears to my eyes every time I see it, Sandy, and I have seen it many, 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 many times. This was Ethan's gift to the world. I did not have the, the privilege of knowing him in person, but I do feel him around this project. And this is what he wanted. He wanted everyone to be aware of this can be, this can be a conscious choice. We can do this in community. The love that was in that room as I watched the film is absolutely palpable. And anyone who sees it can, can feel it. And so 
part of our mission is to get this into as many theaters as possible, to make it available to as many people as possible so that they can start thinking about these things, or if not themselves, they're, perhaps their aging parents or perhaps their friends, whomever. It's just a very, very different way to be around this whole process, which one of the, one of the great spiritual messages that I have heard which I, I take great comfort in is, you know, you humans have it backwards. It's really hard to go from being a giant spirit and compressed into this little tiny baby body, you know, and you celebrate that. When in fact, when it's time for you to get out of that body and go back home, you mourn. You should be celebrating. This is good stuff. What a different message that would be if we started teaching our kids not only to look for the good in the world, but that their lives can have purpose and that going home is nothing to be afraid of. You know, I think this is a movie whose time has come. I mean, I've been noticed over the last two years how many books are being produced about conscious dying, people who are sharing their stories of participating in a loved one's conscious death. And I think, you know, this is something that is definitely on the table for all of us now. I think we're finally ready to look at this one. What do you need? What do the people behind this movie need? Well, um, obviously financial support is always a good thing. So we welcome that. We welcome the participation of other people who are passionate about it. I mean, this became my life work pretty quickly. I did not in a million years ever think that I was going to be executive producing a documentary film. My work had been in television. I, had, I was the creator and host and executive producer of Body and Soul, not because I wanted all three jobs, but because I couldn't find anybody else who'd do it for free. So I have done the executive producer role and I'm one of several. I'm the, the lead producer because I'm, I'm very happy to call on anybody I have ever known who I thought would be helpful in this. and. The, the center is already being deluged with people who want to help and who want to, to get the word out. So I guess our, our biggest issue right, right now is to get into the theaters. That can be expensive. So if anybody wants to support us in that way, great. If you want to talk about the film on your social media, that would be wonderful. If you, you know, in, in the fullness of time, I mean, we're, we're a very small but highly dedicated staff. So in the fullness of time, I'm sure that this will be available. Um, not sure exactly how or where, whether it's universities or libraries or groups or AARP or whatever. Uh, but as I say, I want everybody everywhere to be able to see it. Well, you know, uh, what was it Margaret Mead said about never doubt the power of just a small, you know, group of people, how they can change the world. Um, is there a, a GoFundMe page or something? Indeed, she said it is the only thing that ever has. I love that quote too. That's right, yes. That is a good question. I'm so sorry, Scott, the director is not with us on this call, but I will, there is a GoFundMe page. So I will get that information to you if you don't mind uh, passing it along to anybody who would like to be part of this. We'd, we'd love to know about you. And, and particularly, you know, if this resonates with you, if you have groups of people that you want to share it with, if there are ideas you have, I can't guarantee we'll get to all of them, but we, we sure would love to know that you're out there and that you're supporting us and that you are with us. Well, I think we all know that the last four or five years, you know, since the pandemic, something seems to have happened and we are losing people at a you know, an incredible rate. I know that Time magazine um, had an article about what's happening in England. Um, you know, the death rate is really rocketed. I know somebody um, who lost 12 relatives in, in a six-month period. Um, you know, death is in front of us every day, but it seems to be um, becoming more and more uh, relevant in everybody's lives. This is something we all need to get behind. Well, and I think it's a real opportunity, Sandy, for all of us to, to figuratively at least hold, hold each other's hands and be there for each other. Whether you're struggling with, a, with an imminent situation or you've got a friend who, who needs reassurance and help, uh, it's everybody. It's everybody. This is something we can do. We can be there for each other. 
And what, what could be more meaningful work than that? Yeah, absolutely. Gail, thank you so much for adding your 10 best list to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's library of recommendations. It's been real fun to talk with you and to learn about your life and your stories. And thank you. Uh, thank you. It was my pleasure. Um, I appreciate it. Good. Um, if you would like to learn more about The Last Ecstatic Days movie and see more trailers, visit thelastecstaticdaymovie.com. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. I'll be back at the same time next week with another episode or another 10 best interview to the No BS Spiritual Book Club. Till then, it's goodbye from me and thank you again to Gail Harris.